All right, hi guys. So I'm gonna be talking you through our part two of our lecture notes on biodiversity. Okay, so when we look at biodiversity, we are looking at um, basically elements that are elements, animals that are at risk. So biodiversity is our, you know, um, amount of different species we have around the world. So when we're looking at biodiversity at risk, we're looking at what are some of the things that are putting um, this number of species, you know, in danger. Okay, so we look at the extinction of many species in a relatively short period of time, what is referred to as a mass extinction. So when we think about the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs would be considered a mass extinction. And Earth has experienced what we think are several mass extinctions over time, um, just caused by periodic shifts in global change in the climate. Okay, and it does take millions of years for bio biodiversity to rebound after a mass extinction. So after the mass extinction of the dinosaurs, it, it took our Earth um, millions of years to kind of come back from that um, to producing the number of species that we have today. Okay, so we look at major extinction events. So everywhere on this graph where you see a green arrow pointing and we see kind of a drop in um, the number of marine families, we're looking at a loss of biodiversity. So these are gonna get, be considered major extinction events because our biodiversity numbers drop um, sometimes, you know, hundreds, um, maybe even thousands of species. Okay. Um, so we're looking at current extinctions. So scientists do believe we're in the midst of another mass extinction. And we have increased the amount of species that have become extinct um, by a multiple of 50 since 1800, with up to 25% all, on all the species on Earth becoming extinct um, between 1800 and 2100, which is not that far away for us. Okay, um, and our current mass extinction is different from the past because in the past, humans weren't the primary cause of it. Okay, we had global changes in our climate and we are considered the um, reason for this current mass extinction because yes, it's a global change in climate, but it's a global change in climate that's due to us. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about species prone to extinction, we think about those populations of animals that are smaller, right? So we know that large populations that are um, easily adaptable are not likely to become extinct, but those organisms that are specific to one habitat, let's say, or already have smaller numbers can easily become extinct if we are not careful, right? Um, and those especially at risk are the ones that migrate because they, um, require specific, let's say, um, areas to lay, um, lay eggs or to find their food sources. And those are the habitats that are being exploited by people and we're destroying them. And therefore, when those organisms, you know, return to lay their eggs, it's no longer an option for them. Okay. Um, and so some terms that I know we've heard before um, are endangered and threatened species. So endangered species are species of animals that are identified to be in danger of extinction. Um, and so they're protected by regulations or conservation measures. Um, the panda is considered an endangered species. Right now, the Western lowland gorilla is an endangered species, okay? And then we have something referred to as a threatened species. So this is a species that currently is not endangered, but scientists believe that if we continue on the path that we are on, if we don't make any changes for these particular organisms, they will become endangered in the foreseeable future. Okay. So how exactly do we cause extinctions? I've kind of mentioned some of these already. And here's our poor little polar bear that we've seen in a number of videos. Um, our human population growth has accelerated astronomically over the past two centuries. And therefore, so is the rate of extinctions because when we have more people, more people have to go somewhere. And that means that we take over habitats previously populated by other organisms. Okay, so the four major causes of extinction today are the destruction of habitats, the introduction of non-native species. So species that are not supposed to be living in a particular area and we introduce them for whatever reason, sometimes it's an accident, sometimes it's on purpose. Um, and they take over and they kind of kill out or use all the resources of the already existing organisms. Um, our third cause of extinction is pollution and then the overharvesting of species. Okay, so if we look at the type of species and the number of threatened extinct um, species worldwide, okay, we see plants, the number of threatened plants is unbelievable. The number of threatened mammals, okay, we think that 26% of the mammal species may be threatened, okay. 
And then we also look at the number of things that have gone extinct since 1800. And we may not think of mollusks and worms as important, okay? But when we think of them in the overall structure, remember every single organism plays a role in our food webs, in our food chains. And when we start to mess with one, it can have ramifications all the way up the food chain and maybe even to us. Okay. We look at habitat destruction and fragmentation. Here's a bear that probably was living in the wild um, in a particular area, a forested area, and they built a road through it. Okay, This happens to deer all the time is we build a road through where they previously were living and they get confused and they try to cross the road to get to whatever they need on the other side and they end up getting hit by cars, you know, and things like that. Um, so we use more land to build homes and harvest resources. We destroy and fragment the habitats of other species. Okay, and we believe, scientists believe um, that habitat loss causes about 75% of the extinctions that are now occurring. Okay, so almost all of the extinctions that are now occurring are due to this first type of um, human impact. Okay, um, continuing of habitat destruction and fragmentation, we look at an example of the cougar, which includes the Florida panther. They have an expansive range um, of forest to find their prey. Okay, um, and we have broken apart, we fragmented a lot of their habitat in Florida by building roads, canals, and fences. Okay, so we can no, they can no longer, you know, take the large amount of area they needed to find their prey and to just basically exist. So in 2001, um, scientists estimated there were fewer than 80 Florida panthers um, remaining in the wild population east of the Mississippi River. Okay. Now, um, our second type of um, human impact is invasive exotic species. So an exotic species is one that's considered not native to a particular region, okay? Um, so things that we currently have that just seem so basic, like cats and rats, were at one point in time exotic species. They didn't live here, and they were brought over by um, different cultures, you know, um, to regions where they had never lived before. Rats traveled on all the boats that came over from our earliest settlers, okay? Exotic species can threaten native species that have no natural defenses against them, not designed to have to fight, you know, this giant snake. And therefore, you know, the, the population of that original species will die out, okay? Um, the third one was, or was harvesting, hunting, and poaching. So excessive hunting can obviously lead to an extinction in a particular species. Um, the passenger pigeon was hunted to near extinction um, in the 18 and 1900s, okay? So we do have thousands of rare species worldwide that are harvested and sold for use as pets. Um, you know, remember we're talking about plants and stuff too, herbal medicines. And so we do have protected species, but we all we always have people that engage in poaching or the illegal harvesting of fish game or other species. So things like elephants um, are not allowed to be poached in their native habitats. They have some um, refuges um, in Africa where, you know, you're not allowed to do any poaching. You're not allowed to kill lions and elephants. And all the time people are trying to circumvent these rules so that they can, you know, get their prize. All right. So another one would be pollution. We have pesticides, cleaning agents, other chemicals that make their way into the food web, right? They make their way into the ground. They leach into the soil. It runs off and you run off into the water. So the long-term effects of chemicals don't become clear until many years later, right? We have to have them build up in particular species and we can see what happened. So the bald eagle, our nation symbol, was endangered because of DDT, okay? The pesticide DDT. So it's illegal to use DDT, but it's still manufactured here and used around the world. Um, and so that can find its way into other food sources and then eventually find its way into our soil and our water again. Okay, so when we talk about areas of critical biodiversity, we're looking at areas where there's a lot of different species, right? And so we wanna make sure that we're protecting these particular areas because again, they're, they're hosting so many of our species. And so, um, we talk about endemic species. So this is a species that's native to only a particular place and it's only found there, okay? That's the only place in the world where we're going to find it. So ecologists use the number of endemic species of plants as an indicator of overall biodiversity because plants form the basis of our ecosystem on land, right? 
we have, we eat plants, and there's many other organisms that eat plants that we in turn eat. Um, tropical rainforests are going to be one of these places. Biologists estimate that over half of the world's species live in tropical rainforests, even though tropical rainforests only cover 7% of the Earth's land surface. Okay? And scientists really believe that there are many species, especially plant species, that have never even been discovered within the tropical rainforest. Um, and these species are already disappearing right? Because we're clearing tropical rainforest for farming and cattle grazing. You know, we also had the fires in the Amazon that destroyed a lot of the forest habitats, okay? Um, so we, we have to think about those things. We also look at coral reefs and coral coastal ecosystems. So reefs do provide us with food, right? Tourism revenue, people love to scuba dive and look at the reefs and they're usually in warm tropical places. Um, but they're poorly studied and they're not really as well protected as terrestrial areas are. And so about 60% of Earth's coral reefs are threatened by human activities such as pollution and development along the waterways, okay? Um, these things are also happening in places like swamps and marshes, the shore, okay, kelp heads. Um, a couple years ago, there was a huge controversy because they wanted to build wind turbines off the shore, like our shore, um, on the Atlantic coast and people were so angered by it, but they were angered by it because they, they literally, they argued that they didn't want to see it when they were laying on the beach. Not that no one, well, some people were arguing, but most people weren't arguing for the eco, um, ecological impact that it would have on species living in the oceans. If you were to build these giant wind turbines in the middle of the ocean. Okay. We do look at some particular islands too. Um, one example would be the Galapagos Islands where we see our giant Galapagos tortoises and our, um, finches that we all love from biology and studying Darwin, okay? But there are some islands that have limited numbers of species, okay? And we want to, oftentimes scientists go there to kind of count up and see the global climate impact on those species, okay? There are also what are called biodiversity hotspots, okay? These are our tropical rainforests or coastal areas or islands. So ones we've already been talking about. And so this is just a label that scientists use to identify areas where we have a lot of endemic species. Okay, and here are our biodiversity hotspots around the world. Okay, you can kind of take in that picture. Within the US, one of our biodiversity hotspots is the Florida Everglades. And then we also look at the California coastal region, Hawaii, Midwestern prairies, and the forests of the Pacific Northwest. We just watched that video of the climbing the trees in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we do have a high number of species of freshwater fish, mussels, snails, and crayfish. All right, and that's going to be it for our notes on biodiversity for today for part three or part two. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope to see you in office hours.